Hey, Grace Church. We love you. I'm Benjamin, and this is Heidi, in case some people might be watching for the first time. Or you just forgot our name since it's been so long since you've seen us. Uh, we're going to start by singing an old hymn called I Stand Amazed. We invite you to sing along with us. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Wonder how he could love me. I still I condemned unclean. We sing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden on Calvary, where he suffered and died. Alrighty, it's summertime. We're going to do a summer spiritual and kids. This is a great one. We're going to sing down in the river. And I want you to think through if you heard Jesus was hanging out down at the river, down by church, who would you want to bring with you? This is such a good question. It is. A, who would you bring? <laughs> well, I'd bring you. Oh, of thank course. you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd bring my cats, but I don't think they would want to go. I don't know. If they knew Jesus was there. That's true. They, they might. might. They, they might. might. You're right. right. And maybe say a prayer for that person yes. today. All right, so we're going to sing, and we're going to start with O Brothers, okay? And then we'll do the sisters. As I went down in the river to pray, I was studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, I was studying about that good old way. And who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down. Won't you come on down? Oh, sisters, let's go down, down. Oh, 
brothers, let's go down, let's go down, won't you come on down? Oh, mothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. Let's do, oh, fathers, we don't want to forget the fathers. Yeah. Oh, fathers, let's go down, let's go down, won't you come on down? Oh, fathers, let's go down, down. I think our cat liked that. She just ran she out did. of the room. <laughs> Maybe she does want to go to the river. She might want to. That's pretty cool. All right, let me see. What are we going to do next? I think we're going to do Great Are You Lord. Okay. Yes. That's a good one. I'll just put that down here. I'm going to do that in the key of F. Key of F, everyone. <laughs> For everyone who's following. <laughs> if you have a harmonica at home, actually, it'd be pretty. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, that key. And if you could video yourself yeah. playing it and send it to us, that would be really cool, too. There's enough here. Okay. You guys can't see this, but our cat is chasing her tail as we're singing. We'll try not to crack up too much. <laughs> but it's so cool that God's even given cats breath in their lungs. So It's true. Yeah, we thank God for the breath of life. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath.
breath It's your breath In our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath In our lungs So we pour out our praise To you holy It's your breath In our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath In our lungs So we pour out our praise To you Great are you Lord Great are you So this last song that we're going to do is an old spiritual called Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. I invite you to sing it with us. Grace Church, would you pray with us? Lord, we love you. We ask that you would help us to hear you uh, through Ken's message, um, through the family members that we are with, and through the people that we come in contact with. Thank you that you are always speaking. Will we have ears to hear in Jesus' name? Amen. Love, love you. Love you guys. See you next week. Mwah!
Bye. Hello, Grace Church, Pastor Ken, uh, coming at you again to continue on with our series in the book of Acts. Today we're gonna be in Acts chapter eight and looking at the last part of the chapter. Um, the Bible says uh, very clearly in the book of Joel, one of the Old Testament prophets, and then repeated by Peter on the day of uh, Pentecost, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, later, Paul wrote in the book of, of Romans, chapter 10, he said, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they ever hear about him unless someone uh, tells them about him? Um, we're gonna talk today about how that wonderful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, salvation and reconciliation that comes through Jesus Christ, how it makes it from the, uh, what we know of it in the pages of the Bible into our lives as Christians, and then how it makes it into the life um, of another human being, of another person, or friends, or people, uh, people that we know. Of course, God is at work in all of that. The Holy Spirit uh, moves where he wills and brings the message and brings clarity and responses in every human being, and it's all up to him. But there's also a piece of it that we play in it. Uh, from the very first verses of this book of Acts, where Jesus told his followers, uh, he said, um, you will be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and uh, to the ends of the earth. So um, there's a power there that he spoke of and there's an enablement, but a responsibility for us um, in bringing the message of Jesus Christ to the world around us. So the big idea that I wanna share with you today is this. Most people meet Jesus when a follower of Jesus is sent to talk to them about Jesus. Most people meet Jesus when a person who knows Jesus, I should say a friend of Jesus, is sent to them uh, to talk to them about Jesus. Let's read the text and dive into it. I'll say a few things about it and then um, wrap it up with some suggestions for you about how we can be more effective in obeying Christ, um, especially during the time of of COVID, it's disrupted all of our lives, disrupted our church. Here I am preaching to my telephone again. And uh, last week I preached to about five or six people in this church on a Thursday morning. And then COVID got worse. And we were uh, asked by our governor to get out even less and make sure and wear masks. And I felt that I wasn't being as safe with our people as we possibly could. So we canceled even a small group of people uh, being here for this preaching. So um, we're in the middle of challenges that stand in the way of ministry, of gathering, of functioning as a church. And I'm, to tell you the truth, I'm just as disrupted as you, trying to figure out how it's all gonna shake out. I don't know, but um, I'm gonna to cling to God with it. So let's just read about how he carried out his will and how he brought the gospel to people in tough times and see how the Holy Spirit might apply it to us today. I'm reading from Acts uh, chapter eight, uh, verses 26 through 40. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join his chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless somebody guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. 
Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation, for his life is removed from the earth? The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of who does the prophet say this? Uh, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Gracious Father, we pray that these words would find a, uh, a place to rest in our hearts. Our desire and our intention this morning is to see what of our lives you will change as a result of this word at work in our hearts. We pray that we would hear things this morning, perhaps that we spent all week not wanting to say or hear, that we would think things that seemed unthinkable, that we would be empowered to follow Jesus in ways that we never thought possible, and that you would use your word in that way. We pray for our city, we pray for Portland, for our nation and this world as it teeters uh, under the weight of COVID-19 with increasing exposures, deaths, jam-packed hospitals, all kinds of things that make us suffer and make our dear friends and dear neighbors suffer. And we pray for a resolution, a healing of that virus. We also pray for, pray for a resolution and a healing of the violence that is taking place in our streets, people who are being injured and hurt, uh, the, 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 the friendships hurt, families hurt, um, and the lack of any love and shalom in our community that hurts all of us so much. We, we bring that to you. Jesus is our Lord, and we ask that in love and tenderness, the city around us would see Jesus as its Lord and that he would have his way and be worshiped as king uh, by this dear city of Portland. Bring the healing that seems impossible. Bring that healing um, into our city. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, most people meet Jesus when a follower of Jesus is sent to them to talk to them about Jesus. First off in this story, we see that Philip was sent on the road, to the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. An angel spoke to Philip and said, get up and go. And he sent him on a road uh, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's about a 60 mile stretch in there. And uh, it, wasn't the, one of the, it wasn't the main trade route. Uh, Jerusalem wasn't on the routes of the main roads or anything in Israel. That would have been along the sea, the Mediterranean. Um, but it was, a, it was a, a frequently used road, and it would have been the road used by a person who had been to Jerusalem and was, to, was returning uh, to his home in Ethiopia. So this angel told Philip, just get up and go. Notice he didn't tell him why or who he was going to meet there, or uh, he just said, get up and go. So there's an attitude we see right from the start in Philip. It, it's like he expects to be led by God and told what to do, and he just gets up and does it, and he believes that if he does that, when he gets there, it'll be clear what he's to do, and that's, that's how it ends up in this story. So, along this road, uh, Philip ended up there, and he met an Ethiopian man on the road, and he told him about Jesus. An Ethiopian, okay, Ethiopia was, uh, in its ancient days, was referred to as Kush. It was a, uh, a country, very powerful uh, northern African country, that uh, was located um, uh, uh, upriver on the Nile, um, and, and it was... Uh, 
one of the outposts of the Roman Empire um, at this time. It was known as being a wealthy nation, um, a wealthy country, and um, this man was an Ethiopian. So, he came from this powerful kingdom. It says in the text also that he was a eunuch. Now, a eunuch is a person who's what you might call a, they call it a chamberlain, or it's, it's an officer of the state who is entrusted with managing the private and personal affairs of royalty or uh, of, of, you know, a, a monarch or a king or something like that. And um, he would be in charge of managing the household of a king or, or a queen. And um, as such, he was probably celibate. He probably did not, was not married. Uh, in some instances, eunuchs were even um, men who had uh, taken action uh, against themselves surgically that, that they were unable to have any, any children or have any relationships like that. I think the reason for this is probably to secure their loyalty to the, to the crown and to the government and to ensure that there would never be any possibility of uh, childbirth or, or uh, um, Machiavellian things in the palace for a eunuch to take over the throne or anything like that. In other words, it was a life of great, great commitment. And this man was a powerful man, a eunuch uh, in Ethiopia, and he was a very important court official from Queen Candace. Now, Queen Candace, the uh, queen of the Ethiopians, that's a royal title. All of the queens of Ethiopia were referred to as Candace. And uh, sometimes these queens were the mothers of the kings or the princes of Ethiopia. And they, were, they would manage the affairs of the kingdom and the money and all of that, while the king, who was kind of thought of as a deity figure, uh, would, would, I don't don't know what he would do, but he had his mother who would be uh, running things. Basically, it was that kind of a that kind of a system. This Ethiopian also had a very important job. He administered the royal treasury of Ethiopia. He was he was in charge of the treasures and the wealth of Ethiopia. In that day and age, of course, he would be very powerful and uh, granted tremendous freedom to be able to travel in his own chariot to Jerusalem, hundreds and hundreds of miles away, uh, to worship his God as, as a Jew. And he was of the Jewish faith. He had gone to Jerusalem uh, to worship. Now remember this, that, that, that like a, a Muslim going to Mecca, Jew to Jerusalem, perhaps Christians might associate or Catholics might associate a trip to the, uh, to the Vatican as, as going to the geographical center of their particular religion. So the Jews, all Jews that could afford to do so, would make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem as often as they could uh, to, to, uh, to worship in the temple. Now, according to the Old Testament law, a eunuch was not allowed to worship with the people of God. But I don't know, at the, at the t by the time of Christ, and, and by this particular time, I don't know how uh, meticulous and, and exacting they were about enforcing those rules and laws, especially for people like our U Ethiopian friend here who had a lot of money. So he was on his way back from worshiping uh, in Jerusalem and he was reading his Bible. Sounds like he probably stopped by the side of the road, but I don't know that for sure. But um, he was reading his Bible. He was reading the prophet Isaiah, probably a scroll rolled up. It might have been one that he purchased in Jerusalem because I know even today when you travel in Jerusalem and go through the shops, it's a, it's a very popular thing to buy a copy of the, uh, particularly the Old Testament Bible that has been blessed by one of the rabbis there. And uh, it could be that he, he picked up uh, his, this particular version of the Bible uh, in Jerusalem, but he was reading it. Philip ran up and, and the, the spirit said to Philip, go up and join his chariot. 
run up and join his chariot. So Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, well, how can I understand what I'm reading unless somebody explained it to me? And we learn there then that the passage that he was preaching on was Isaiah 53, um, which speaks of the suffering of the Lamb of God or the servant of God, uh, led as a sheep to slaughter, as a lamb before its shearer is silent, he does not open his mouth in humiliation, his judgment was remo is removed from the, the earth. And the, the eunuch said, who's this talking about? Is this talking, is Isaiah writing about himself? Or is he writing about someone else? Uh, is he writing about something that is going to happen? Or something that has happened? What is he writing about? He may have known the tradition that Isaiah himself was, was killed, uh, I believe killed before the altar, I'm not sure. But killed by being sawn in two, according to Jewish tradition. So I don't know exactly what he was thinking, but he was perplexed. And the reason for his perplexity is a lot deeper than just wondering about Isaiah the prophet. It's because from the time it was written, there has been great discussion and great speculation uh, amongst the Jewish faith over who this text of scripture in Isaiah 53 is speaking about. Is it talking about a person? Clearly, it's the servant of the Lord. It's the fourth of four passages in the book of Isaiah that speak of the servant of the Lord who is clearly uh, God with us, who is clearly the Messiah. And there was much debate and speculation as to who this servant of the Lord would be and how they would recognize him uh, when he came. Now, the reason it was difficult to recognize him is this. It was a suffering Messiah that Isaiah was writing about. It was inconceivable to the Jews that their Messiah would be a suffering Messiah. They saw their Messiah as a grand military uh, leader. They didn't see him necessarily as divine, but they saw him as possessing divine powers and ruling Israel and ruling the nations of the world and defeating all of Israel's enemies. They never conceived of him as being silent like a sheep going to the shearer or uh, suffering such indignation and, and, and horror. So that's why they had trouble understanding who this prophecy could be written about. And Philip answered the question and, and be opening his mouth, beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And the text tells us that the uh, Ethiopian believed and was baptized. The text, actually, it just says the Ethiopian says, look, here's water. How about if I'm baptized? Well, for him to want to be baptized is a profession of faith, and it's faith in Jesus Christ, uh, which, which is what Peter was talking to him about. So uh, he said, why not baptize me here? And, and uh, Philip baptized him. Now in your Bibles, you probably have a verse, verse 37, and I didn't read it when I was reading this earlier on purpose. Um, because it says, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus, is the, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he baptized him. Well, that is not in the earliest copies of this manuscript of Scripture. And it appears that that verse was placed in there as a, a doctrinal, kind of a doctrinal test for people who were being baptized, new, new people being baptized, as a way to ensure a doctrinal precision before someone was baptized. Uh, it wasn't important to Philip and it wasn't important to Luke to do that or have that before a person was baptized, but it was important within a couple hundred years and it ended up being uh, put into the, into the text it, itself. So I've left it out because it's, it's pretty solid that it's just simply not in the original documents. So Philip baptized the, the Ethiopian and it says they went, both of them, down into the water because whereas Jewish baptism was a ritual done maybe every day or several times a week where a person would baptize himself or you know, lowering themselves into water and then coming out of the water as preparation, ritual preparation for worship, Christian baptism 
beginning with John the Baptist, but uh, more so with Jesus and his command and on Pentecost, Christian baptism is a person being baptized by um, another person, much like the way we receive salvation. We don't do it ourselves and we don't do it alone. Uh, we receive salvation when God reaches out and participates and saves us and he uses people to, to be a part of that a lot. So uh, he went into the water, uh, Philip as well as the eunuch, and then he baptized him. And then Philip was snatched away. The spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and he found himself at Azotus, uh, um, which is Ashdod, a, a, an old Philistine city on the Mediterranean coast. Philip worked his way up the coast, settled in Caesarea uh, um, um, Maritima, which is a large Roman city on the coast of, of northern Israel. Uh, the main Roman capital city, I guess you could say, in that area. At least it was, a, it was quite a big one. And uh, lived there and settled there with his wife and had four daughters. Later in the book, it tells us they were all prophetesses. And that's where Peter, uh, where the story uh, leaves Philip, excuse me. And it says the, the Ethiopian noticed Philip was suddenly gone. And he went on his way, returning home uh, with great joy and, and rejoicing. Most people meet Jesus when Jesus sends somebody who knows him to talk about him. So I want to, just looking at the life of Philip, leave, leave you with, with a few ideas, four, four qualities here that I see of somebody who is an effective, and, I, and more than effective, I think I should say an obedient witness to Jesus Christ. Because effective means, you know, I led four people to Jesus last, last week. I'm an effective evangelist. No, it doesn't. God is effective to save people. We are not effective as much as we are obedient. So what are four qualities of an obedient follower of Jesus Christ regarding how we talk to other people and, and, uh, and love them? Well, the first thing that I see here is an effective witness, an obedient witness, is eager to be sent wherever God leads them to go. There is an eagerness to be sent wherever God sends. Um, Philip, uh, he, first of all, he, he gets this word that instead of returning to Jerusalem or staying in Samaria, I don't know, you, you know what, what his situation was. He was probably from northern Israel and he doesn't go home to his, to his wife or his children. Uh, he doesn't go back to Jerusalem with the apostles. The Spirit of God, an angel of the Lord, it tells us, <clears throat> tells him, go to the desert road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And he gets up and just goes. There's an eagerness to obey Christ to listen to the Spirit of God speaking to you. And then when he gets there, the Spirit actually tells him, go up and join that, that chariot there, the one with the Ethiopian in it. And it says that Philip runs up to the chariot. That might mean it was moving. But um, there's an eagerness on his part. Now, you may not have that eagerness because it's uncomfortable talking about Jesus. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable. People easily get offended, and, and even in this day and age, in this culture, it's, it's often treated as, as socially just inappropriate to speak of religion or Jesus like that. There's a lot of reasons you might not be eager to talk to your friends and family and people you meet about the Lord Jesus. And I'm not going to guilt or shame you into why you should. I'll just say, if you are, which is like me, I am, really. But if you are, if you're like me, the answer is to start out talking to the Lord about it. Um, it's to start out saying, I, I'm not like that, and I want to be like that. Whatever it looks like for me, I know you love me, Lord, and I know you've given this command, and I know I don't have to become something I'm not in order to be faithful at it, but I do want to obey so the first thing that we see is there's an eagerness to obey in a person that's used by God in this way. Secondly, uh, effectiveness or obedience in witnessing for Jesus. The second thing is they're attentive to what people are saying and thinking and asking about Jesus Christ. They're attentive to what people are saying and thinking and asking about Jesus Christ. 
Now, I don't know about you, but in times when I've tried to share the gospel or speak with people about Jesus, I have not been a, <laughs> I have not been a good listener. Uh, I've, why? Well, because I have something I want to say. And everything they say is only the building materials for me to use to craft the conversation to the point to where I can say what I want to say about Jesus or uh, the gospel and that. I'm not a good listener. But we find Philip here, first off, listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to the, this angel of, of God, um, listening to the Spirit speaking to him, and then listening to the Ethiopian as he reads his Bible. Now, in that day, people generally read out loud. Um, that's just the way that language worked, and it's the way readers worked, really, until a couple of, maybe 150 years ago. But you generally, when you read, you read out loud. Philip listened to what he was reading and interacted with that. Do you know what you are reading? And he listened to what the Ethiopian said. How could I know without a guide? Um, he started out with an interest in knowing what this Ethiopian was reading and thinking about what he was reading. Now, when we want to witness for Christ or we want to speak to people about him, it's critical that we listen to what people say ahead of time and, and what they have to say to us about what they do believe about Jesus. Oftentimes, we just want to lay on them some sort of a, a pre-designed uh, list to check off to go through to salvation, or perhaps we have three or four main points that have to be present in, in order to say we've shared the gospel, and we just want to munch that out and tell them things that they need, we think, they need to know. But as Philip was doing this here and witnessing for Christ, he was interested in hearing about the Ethiopian. And we need to speak to people out of a sense of genuine, humble interest in knowing what they believe. What they believe, we may or may not even have an answer for it. We may or may not even know, understand it. We, we, it it's not, we don't hear what people believe in order to correct their beliefs. We want to understand what people believe, what they're saying, and really listen to them so that we can gain a closer, uh, more genuine uh, emotional connection with them to where we're really, uh, truly communicating with them. So we're eager to go where we're sent. We're eager, we're attentive to what people are saying and thinking about Jesus. Um, yeah, we want to understand what they think. They, you know, a lot of people today, what they think is, well, Jesus may have lived and he may not have lived, but it's irrelevant to me today. And that's great for them to say what they're thinking because then we, then we have something on the table to talk about. Third, in terms of uh, what is an obedient witness, they are respectful of people's openness and desire to talk about Jesus. They're respectful. The Ethiopian invited Philip into his chariot with him. Philip didn't run up and jump in the chariot. I imagine he would have gotten in a lot of trouble if he'd done something like that. Um, he was invited up. Effective and obedient witnesses for Jesus Christ are sensitive and respectful of what they are being told by the people they're, they're speaking to. They're respectful of if somebody is open to having that kind of discussion uh, uh, about religion right now. They're respectful of if, if a person really wants to talk about Jesus or not. It's really okay when you're talking with somebody and, the, and, and, and say the Lord brings this opportunity of a religious discussion, you're talking about Jesus or you're starting to, and it's really okay for you to stop and say, um, this is some heavy stuff, are you okay talking about this? Or, and the person m might say, oh yeah, go on, this is great. Or the person might say, nah, it's kind of awkward. I, you know, Hey, guess what? That's a very clear indicator that you need to back off then. Um, we don't bring people kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. That's the indicator that we need to be 
like all courteous, mature people, um, sensitive to what people are, are saying and wanting. How many dinner table, oh man, I have ruined a few dinners and family gatherings in my time by having a very specific agenda that I wanted to talk about, usually about religion, with my family, my parents, my sisters, everybody, and wanting to steer that conversation uh, to where I want it to go. And by a number of, of, of unspoken cues and small comments, it's very clear that nobody's into talking about what Ken's wanting to push and talk about, but I would just try to drive on with my agenda and my desires. And um, that's not the way Philip was. He was appropriate and respectful and kind and uh, the great commission of Christ. I used to think that gave me the right to offend and the right to uh, smack people with the gospel whenever I wanted to. And what a horrible and evil way of looking at the wonderful commandments of Christ that was. Um, so an obedient witness is very sensitive to the uh, desires and the feelings of the people that she or he is are speaking to. Finally, the last thing I see here is that an obedient witness to Jesus Christ is very clear about what they're sent to do. Talk about Jesus. Now in this day and age with social media, with Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, email, <laughs> all of the all of the ways of communication, there are ideas that are shotgun scattered out into the culture. Uh, people can wake up in the morning and write a paragraph about their political opinions of the country or of the president or of anything and push a button and push send and their thinking and their idea and their musing will, will just spread all out into cyberspace and people can read it around the world. Um, so what I'm saying is we're, we're flooded with communication and it flies out there. It's tempting for Christians to piggyback onto current social issues and current political issues as a means of uh, carrying them into what they hope will be evangelism or they hope will turn into a proclamation of the kingdom of God. It's, it's tempting, but it never works that way. God has not promised to bless you or I when we speak about other things as important as they are, uh, uh, as important as global warming, as uh, systemic racism in our country, as needs for reform in everything from policing to politics, the need for integrity in our president and in the White House and in our political system, um, our relationship with other nations around us, our management of the COVID-19 virus and, and how, much, um, how much we should uh, force people, direct people to act certain ways to protect their neighbors from that virus. Um, important issues, gun rights, uh, uh, how, how far do they extend into the, how much, uh, how, what what kind of gun you can have and, and uh, all of those, those issues. These are important things. But they are not meant to be vehicles to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are all, in one way or another, symptoms of a world without Christ. And in the individual, they're symptoms of a person without Christ. So we stay on target, we stay on mission to speak of Jesus Christ and we don't trick people into other conversations about other issues and then hope to bring in the gospel of Jesus Christ if you confess Jesus as Lord, you're saved. Uh, we don't use other issues as keys to unlock the door for the important issue of Jesus Christ. The reason we don't is because that's manipulative. That is not a way to treat a person or to speak to them, and people feel ripped off when you do that. So, in summary, effectiveness and obedience in evangelism and witnessing to Christ, there, we need to be eager to be sent where God would send us. We need to be attentive to what people around us are saying about Christ, about religion. What do they really believe? Before we tell them what we believe, or before we tell them what they're supposed to believe, we need to listen. What do they believe? 
They are respectful of people's openness and desire to talk about Jesus. We don't steamroll people with the gospel or with our religious opinions. We wait until we're invited. We think our message is so powerful that we don't really even have to, uh, we don't have to manipulate or cajole people to hear it. We believe the Spirit of God will bring it up and bring us where he needs us to be to talk about it. And finally, obedient witnesses are very clear about what they're sent to do. They are not sent to do many, many of the important, vital, good things. They are sent to talk about the one person, Jesus Christ, the answer to every human, uh, human need. So the big idea today was that most people meet Jesus when a follower of Jesus is sent to talk to them about Jesus. Guess what follower of Jesus God wants to send to your friends who haven't met Jesus? Gracious Father, send us. We'll trust you to take care of all the other things that need to happen or that we might need to change or grow or confess or whatever. We'll trust you with all that, but our prayer as we look at this scripture is that we would be sent as you have sent us by command, but individually, specifically, each person in our church, we would hear your voice sending us and trusting that wherever we end up, we are there to represent and to speak of the dear Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Thanks.